um, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Santa Fe and surrounding areas. Uh, so today, what uh, what we're going to talk about is the um, what I call these my six key elements when um, when deciding and choosing on a geographic farm. So this is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is probably, I think, the most important um, the important thing to. Uh, Let's see, I'm gonna change my, there we go. I think this is the most important thing to, uh, to consider when, uh, if you're wanting to have a long-term career in real estate, really, this is the number one thing. If you know any dominant agents in any market anywhere, um, the, the biggest thing that they do and the biggest pillar of business that they have is, is most likely geographic farming. Um, does that make sense? Everybody know what geographic farming is? Do we need to explain it at all? Okay. Um, there's uh, there's several different ways to go about creating a farm and to working a farm, but what um, and to being to becoming the dominant agent in a farm. But what we're going to talk about today is um, <clears throat> is choosing the right geographic farm for you. Um, and and not every, every not every farm is right for every person, right? So. Um, you might, if you're a newer agent, you might not want to be in a luxury farm just yet until you build up your experience levels, uh, things like that. So you want to you want to match your personality and your style to your farm. Um, so again, we're not going to be talking about how to be the dominant agent, but we're going to be talking about choosing the right farm for you. Sound good? Everybody ready? Yeah. Sounds All right. Great. Number one, item number one, and I'll, and I'll send out notes, uh, my my bullet points to this or one there later on if you uh, if you ask me but uh, number one let's just go ahead and knock this one off the list first it's a uh, total number of homes in a market right you want to make sure that uh um that, that you know i'd like to pick a farm that has about 500 homes in it um but you know not all areas of the country that's always possible but but we want to know the total addressable market um, for the neighborhood so that's number one real simple and easy uh, and and, in, and if we're in a vertical living environment, right, it could be as simple as the number of units that are in a, in a townhome complex or condo um, complex. Um, but if you're in most like like areas here around Santa Fe, it's going to be spread out sort of neighborhood um, uh, that's identifiable, right? So that's easy one. Lock that one out. Total number of homes addressable market. Number two, the average sales price and trend. Now, we all know how to, to go in and create a, uh, a quick market analysis and look at the average sales price, right? That's easy. But what I would uh, suggest doing is doing a, uh, what is the trend in the, in the uh, neighborhood? Say, so go back three years and say, so three years ago, the average sales price for this neighborhood was this. Two years ago, it was this. Last year, it was this. And this year, it's this. So what we are seeing, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is that the average trend is in, uh, average sales price is increasing in trend by 7% year over year. That makes sense, everyone? We all good on that? You see me? We all good on that one? Um, makes sense, right? So what this is gonna do is this is gonna give you more speaking points and it's gonna frame you as being more of the neighborhood expert. So we wanna know the trend. So quick recap, total number of homes was number one. Um, number two is the average sales price and trend for the neighborhood. Um, let's see, number three. So, um, so number three is gonna be average days on the market. Right? We all know that uh, average days on the market is, is uh, very important right now. It's one of the most important things. So if we can pick a neighborhood that, uh, that average days on the market are about 30, that means that we could potentially get into a neighborhood and start farming and uh, potentially sell 11 homes a year there. Um, you know, that 12th home is going to bleed over into the next year, but year over year, it should start increasing and in being able to uh, sell. So we want to pick a, uh, pick a neighborhood that has a, a, a lower average days on the market. And again, these are, these are the six key elements when choosing a geographic farm. So if you're trying to decide on one farm over another farm, that might be one of the best things. And you're not going to knock it out of the park on all six of these elements, guys. It might be that um, we're going to just we might get to 80% of these things. So the, the higher you can get, the better that this farm will be for you. 
Okay, so quick recap. Number one, total number of homes. Number two is average sales price and trend. Uh, number three is going to be the average days on the market. We want uh, one with lower average days on the market. Okay, and so bear with me here on this, guys, but we got some math, okay? I know uh, everybody's going to start freaking out. They don't want to do math. If you are driving right now, just listen to this. Don't try to worry about it. Don't try to get the math down. So uh, it's, not, it's not hard. So um, we're going to talk about the turnover and the velocity of a neighborhood, okay? Turnover, we all know what turnover is. How many homes sell in that neighborhood? Say if you have a, a neighborhood with 100 houses, 10 homes sell a year, the unit turnover is going to be 10%, right? 100 divided by 10 is 10%. So the unit turnover is 10%. However, what I would uh, employ you to think about is the velocity of the neighborhood as well. So we all know there's two sides to every transaction. So there's actually 20 sides in that neighborhood of 100 homes. 10 unit sales, 20 total velocity sales. So we could talk about it. When you, when you use the term, uh, the, the turnover, um, we wanna make sure we say unit turnover or our number of, of the velocity for the neighborhood. So, so uh, I think it would, uh, it would make us, again, frame ourselves as the expert when we are uh, talking with Mr. and Mrs. Buyer or Mr. and Mrs. Seller, when we're talking about a specific neighborhood. That makes sense to everyone? Um, I have a question, Ray. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, so when we talk about unit sales, that's a, a, that's a um, hard number, let's say, 10 sales in a neighborhood of 100. And so the velocity is based on the, the trend or like a couple of year trend or, or how, how is the velocity calculated other than 100 homes over 10 sales? Because it, it seems to me like that's 10 units. No, no, actually I see it now. It is 10% velocity and 10, 10 homes sold out of 100, correct? Right, so well, would be, it would be, uh, very good question. So. Um, the, um, the, uh, there would be 10% would be the, um, the turnover, but the velocity would be actually 20%. So 20 sides divided by that same number of homes. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Sorry, I may yes. have been a little confusing. That's on okay. That. Then that's good. All right. Good. Any other questions on that? Pretty simple math, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So back to a quick recap. Number one, total number of homes. Number two, the average sales price and its trend over the last three years, five years, wherever you want to go back. Uh, number three be the average days on the market. Um, number four is going to be the turnover and the velocity. And then number five, the next thing we have here is, uh, is there a dominant agent in the market? So we can go back into the MLS, pull the sales data for the neighborhood, and uh, you download that into an Excel spreadsheet and say, let's look and see. And when I say a dominant agent, I'm saying, is there anyone who has more than 10% of the sides, the buyer and the seller sides, more than 10%, I would say that's a dominant agent. Again, it's not, it uh, doesn't mean that that neighborhood is, uh, is, is too difficult to, uh, to break into. Uh, it just may mean that you may need to go in there bigger and better or be that purple cow and be different. So a dominant agent, um, one agent having more than 10% market share. And then, you know, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing if there's a dominant agent in the market. Um, it, and if you, if you understand this data, we can and then look at it and see why are they the dominant agent? What are they doing? And if you live in the neighborhood, that makes it even easier for you, right? You can say, uh, are they actively farming? Um, are they running Facebook ads? When you look on Zillow, Trulio, Realtor.com, do you actually see that they have listings in that neighborhood? Um, are they doing uh, neighborhood events? Uh, uh, pictures with the Easter bunny? Are they doing uh, Christmas tree pickup events? Any kind of things like that? Are they, are they actively farming? Um, again, the online ads, are, there's lots of other ways to break into a neighborhood, but we're just talking about the elements to consider when choosing a farm, okay? So number one, total number of homes. Number two, average sales price. Number three, days on the market. Number four, the turnover and velocity. Number five, is there a dominant agent? Okay, and then so the last thing is going to be accessibility of the farm. So this is uh, the very last thing to consider. 
what is the is the farm is the farm easily accessible? Meaning, can you walk the, down the streets and knock on doors? Can you do um, do events in the neighborhood? Uh, is it gated and guarded? Right. That that doesn't mean that you necessarily can't farm in this neighborhood. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to get in there and to do things. Hang door door flyers, knock on doors, walk the streets, talk to people do events, do again, do uh, Easter bunny pictures or Christmas tree pickup events, any, any of those types of things. Um, so, okay, uh, again, number one was total number of homes. Number two, average sales price, three days on the market. Number four, turnover and velocity. Number five, dominant agent. And then number six was the accessibility to the farm. In um, accessibility to the farm, you know, a strict HOA for a, a neighborhood could, uh, could be a hindrance. So again, it doesn't mean you can't get into that neighborhood. It just makes it more difficult. But if it's more difficult for you, it's also more difficult for your competition. An easier farm to get into is also easier for your competition. So it's all relative. Okay, so again, with this information now, with their, your six key elements of picking a geographic farm, um, this is a long-term, long-tail strategy for being in real estate. If you want to be... Uh, if you plan on being in the market a long time and scaling your business bigger and bigger and bigger year after year after year, then geographic farming is definitely something that I recommend everyone getting into. We'll get into uh, further discussions later on about how to become a dominant agent, but, uh, but, but picking a, the right geographic farm for you and, uh, and, and starting to work on that um, will save you uh, a lot of time and, and headache and money, right? If you pick the wrong geographic farm. I've done it. I've gone down that road. I went into my own neighborhood back in Dallas and started. I was spending $2,500 a month on this big, glossy 11 by 17 fold over. And I knew there were some dominant agents, but I didn't really know this information at that point. And uh, I, for a year, I spent $2,500 a month and never got one phone call. Finally, went to, uh, went to my coach and said, here's what I'm doing. What am I, you know, what's going on? It's like, well, what's, what's the data, you know? So we looked at it. There was uh, one person used to, used to be a Keller Williams agent. He sold to, uh, to Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and he, he's doing about five to 600 homes a year in my neighborhood. He had 51% of the sides. That's a lot. <laughs> I wish I had that in any neighborhood. So anyway, that's what you should strive to be. Um, that's where, uh, that's, this is when you can, you, when you get some traction in one farm, well, now you can scale that into another farm and you just keep growing year after year after year. All right, what questions do we have? That's all I have. Great presentation, Rice, Array. Oh, awesome, thank you. Uh-huh. Come on. Hey, Ray, oh, so gotta... what, uh, besides like neighborhood events and things like that, um, you know, you and I talked about, would you do just like, postcards and, and things like that, um, what ways do you uh, reach out to these folks? Yeah, so postcards is kind of the, the number one normal way that, uh, that most people take over a neighborhood. Um, and, and if there is a dominant agent in there right now that is doing that, it's hard to, uh, to supplant them, right? You've got to go in bigger, better, brighter, more colorful postcards. You need to come in with... Um, with a home valuation, landing page, website. Um, um, you know, there, again, there's lots of different ways to doing it. You know, you want to um, um, digital and social strategy um, is, is to go along with your direct response postcards, um, you know, is, is key and, and very good. If you live in the neighborhood and you have kids going to schools in the neighborhood, that, that always helps. Um, uh, you know, it's a little, uh, it's harder for those of us that are a little bit older and our kids are gone and graduated. Um, you know, I remember a lot of my business, you know, 10 years ago came from friends of my kids' parents, right? So uh, did that answer your question, Craig? Yeah, I was wondering if you or anyone else has had any success in using Nextdoor. I, I have not. Um, you know, we partner with Nextdoor on our neighborhood campaign. Um, uh, Nextdoor is the one who created all those neighborhoods for us inside of KW Command. So um, I, yeah. I know it's pretty expensive and it's, you know, it's more branding type stuff. And Craig, you, I know you and I have had those conversations. Um, I'm not big on branding <laughs> right in the beginning. 
Ray, Bob yeah, has, um, we have has conversations about that, that later on in, in more other more episodes. I don't want to keep this. I want to keep this pretty short and not get into much of the uh, of the blocking and tackling of geographic farming. But uh, this this episode was really more meant to uh, how to pick your geographic farm. Yeah, Ray. This is Pat. Yeah, hi, Pat. Yeah, when you were talking about uh, days on the market, is there a window that you look at as far as that days on the market? Because it's always it's always a floating number as far as I guess. How far, how far back do you do your days on the market? Um, you know, when I run a CMA, it it depends. I you I will go back. Uh, I try to go back 30 days, you know, if it's a big enough neighborhood with a big enough lot enough, you know, with yes, enough I, Dr. Neighbor, I will go back just 30 days. If I was doing, um, I was doing a CMA like a, an appraiser, right? I, so if I need to, I like to get 10 sold, 10 pendings and 10 actives, right? So if you have to go back 60 days or, or six months or 90 uh, or one year, um, you know, just go back as far as you have to go to get enough data. That you feel is relevant. Okay, thank you. It's a little bit subjective. Tara, did you have a question a while ago? No, I was just, um, he was asked, Craig was asking about next door, and Bob has been on there for about, I don't know, three years yeah. and really just gotten complaints because they don't, uh, they about the way they, uh, they update their listings. Um, they don't update them. They have ones that are on the market that are already off the market. It's it's just their algorithm. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's you know similar to um, the old thing with uh, with Zillow, right? Their data is bad. That's what we tell the consumers out there. However, um, I would I would suggest that it does open up a conversation about real estate. So. Um, you know, having having excellent conversion skills on how how to um, uh, convert those type of people. At least you know maybe they're at least they are having a real estate conversation. Yeah, true. Uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily spend money on doing that type of farming. But again, we can have that. Maybe we can uh, have a future episode here in the next coming week <laughs> to talk about farming. Anyone else? Um, Ray? Hey, I have a question. Um, so how often should you be contacting the farm area once you get started in there? Excellent, good question. Again, that's a little bit more into the strategy, but uh, I, you know, it all depends on you know, how much of a dominant agent you do have in there. Um, in the beginning, um, there was, uh, I have seen some proof before, I don't remember exactly where it was, but, but going every 10 days for the first three months and then going to every uh, other week for a couple of months and then going to once a month would get you some pretty good traction. It's kind of like uh, Gary Keller's, you know, eight by eight and then moving into a, uh, a 36 touch. You want to hit them hard and fast so that they remember you um, and, and get your name out there, get it going. And then you can space it out a little bit more after that. Good question. Ray. Dan. Very quick one. Turnover, uh, ten percent. What are you looking for? Are you looking for a higher turnover, a lower turnover? What constitutes? What number is high or low? And how does velocity matter? Does that just show that some agents are dominant on both sides? Yeah, very good question. So, I would say anything over six percent turnover is um, a unit turnover is good. Um, for a neighborhood, that would be one to go after. You know, getting closer to that 10% is excellent. Um, you know, in places like Santa Fe, that might be lower turnover because uh, people come here to uh, to retire and they stay quite a bit longer. You know, in, in most most areas of the country, um, people over at the average is six to seven years in a house and they're, you know, moving up or moving down. So, um, yeah, that's that's a very good question and something to look at for sure. I would say probably the bread and butter price points are going to be, you know, most likely have higher velocity. Um, but uh, so the uh, the velocity, your, your question on the velocity, um, I think I mentioned before that it would um, more so in being good speaking points to whenever you're speaking with a buyer or a seller in the neighborhood, you'll be able to talk to unit turnover and also velocity. 
Sound good? Thanks, Thanks Kent. Yeah. Anybody else? Very good. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today. Appreciate all the uh, interaction and, uh, and questions. Thank you. See you guys next time. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Yeah, bye.
I didn't get off the Zoom call. Whoops. 